Welcome to another edition of Understanding the Symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. And we're still looking at the temptation of Saint Anthony. And these are the outside panels. And these are the inside panels. In the center panel, we have Saint Anthony receiving a vision. I'm going to argue that this is an Ebionite vision because Hieronymus Bosch was an Ebionite. And because it's full of Ebionite symbols. And this time around, we're going to concentrate on one specific symbol. And to read that symbol, we'll be using our five keys for understanding the symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. So to begin with, it's exactly what it looks like. So what does it look like? Well, we see a man brandishing a unsheathed sword. What are swords for? Swords, especially at this time, were your primary killing weapon. So, especially an unsheathed sword, this is a man who lives by killing and threatening. And he's holding the sword over his head. So, this the violent tendency is dominant in his life. He is a man. We can tell that because he is naked. He has no breasts. But he is wearing the hat of a woman. So this is a womanized man. Um, there's actually no, no part of this little symbol is magic. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we can follow the money because a naked man has no money but needs money. And notice the negative. Notice that he's silhouetted against, he stands out around that rotten fruit behind him. And finally, he is in a basket. And now we can read the Bible. Does the Bible mention anyone in baskets? Yes, it does. We have two prominent people in baskets, and they're both pictured here. The most famous person in a basket was, of course, the baby Moses. And Bosch has added, sort of as a balance, the baby Moses to the composition. We see poor baby Moses being towed through the sewer and not having a good time of it at all. The other famous Bible personality that traveled in a basket was Paul. So we meet Paul at the stoning of Stephen, where he's aiding and abetting the murder. And after he's done this daylight murder, he then, on his own initiative, marches up to the high priest and asks for a rest warrant. And so, uh, Apparently, that's exactly what he does with comrades, uh, goes to Damascus, and according to Paul, he meets Jesus there in the wilderness. But we know that's a lie, because Jesus said, do not believe anyone who tells you that they meet me in the wilderness. And so, because we are good Ebionites, we believe Jesus and reject. Paul. So we know Paul wasn't converted in the wilderness. So what did happen? Well, here we have to rely on the Bible again, where it says, and Paul is speaking, and he says that he was convinced he ought to do all he could to oppose the name of Jesus. And he goes on to say, he did it with the authority of the chief priests. I put many saints in prison, and even con they were condemned to death, and I frequently had them punished in the synagogues, and made them blaspheme. In my raging fury to them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So, he, we know he went to the high priest, he got papers, he got papers to go to Damascus. Uh, and this is all very important because the high priest doesn't have jurisdiction in Damascus. 
and that's important to our basket story. So apparently what Paul did, he was either a bounty hunter in the payroll of the high priest, because the high priest doesn't just hand out warrants to anybody who just walks up and casually asks for one, uh, but he does have hired thugs and assassins. And Paul had just finished stoning Stefan with his buddies. And so it's possible that he was given money to find a certain persons, and he was giving letters of introduction to the synagogue in Damascus. But he was supposed to keep it quiet because they have no jurisdiction there. They cannot arrest people. It's out of their territory. And that is why when the local king found out, and probably Paul was ratted out by the Jews there who didn't want to cooperate. The Jews in Damascus, in fact, the rest of the world, resent the high priest in uh, Jerusalem because the high priest was appointed by the Romans. He was a collaborator. And so that's one reason why they were living in Damascus. So it's very possible that when he went there to ask for their help, that instead they turned him into the local authorities. And when the local authorities found out he was there to kidnap people, they wanted to have a word with him. And so he had to escape in a basket. And it could be that Paul didn't actually have the high priest's permission to go out of the jurisdiction and stick his nose in Damascus. And he, now he's created an international incident which threatens his the high priest's job. And the high priest is the sort of person who hires murderers and thugs like Paul. So Paul knows he's in terrible, terrible trouble. So at the time that Paul is lowered in the basket, he is naked. That is, he is a man without a country. So we have a man in a basket who is full of murderous rage, and he's running away like a girl. But now we come to the theological and heretical part of the story. We're going to be dealing with two timelines. The first one belongs to Paul, and he tells us what happened after his uh, fake conversion. Uh, he says he did not go to Jerusalem. He says, but he went into Arabia and later returned to Jerusalem. No, Damascus. He says, only after three years did I go up to Jerusalem to confer with Cephas, that means Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days, but I saw none of the other apostles except James. And then he has to add, I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. And uh, every time Paul says that he's writing something that is not is a lie, it is. And in this case, it's his conversion. But what you need to get is the timeline that he once he was converted, he did not go to Jerusalem. He went instead to Arabia. He went to Arabia for three years. He then returned to Damascus, and only then did he go to Jerusalem and meet uh, Peter and James there. And he kind of stresses that he didn't uh, he didn't learn anything while he was there. We're told the disciples were afraid of him, and it's only Barnabas that vouches for him. But what does Barnabas actually know? And so, and it's Paul preaches to Greek-speaking Jews, and they try to murder him. But the other disciples don't have that problem when they preach. And they send Paul off to Antioch. And it's, well, they send him off to Tarsus, and it says peace breaks out once Paul's gone. So that's Paul's timeline. 
he had his so-called conversion, but then he went to Arabia for three years. Then he went back to Damascus, and only then did he go to Jerusalem for the first time. However, Luke has a different timeline in his book of Acts. Things happened very quickly. First, Paul had a conversion on the road to Damascus. Once he was in Damascus, he began preaching boldly so that the Jews sought to kill him so that he had to escape in a basket. But then Barnabas introduced him in Jerusalem to the brothers there where he apparently, by his own word, didn't mix much with the people that actually knew Jesus, but instead managed to get himself in a public argument at the temple and again had to be hustled out of town. And it says that after he left town, peace broke out. Everyone got along fine once Paul was gone. But that's the a series of events that seems to have taken place o over the period of time of maybe 30 days in Luke's telling of the story. But Paul, the man who was there, just told us that it was over years when all that took place. Years. That tells you, <laughs> you can't trust the Bible's account. And there must be a different way to understand the story. So everything I've told you is more or less what Hieronymus Bosch would have understood of the story of Paul and the value of the lesson of the man in the basket, that it discredits you know, the Bible kind of in general, but specifically the Gospel of Luke in particular, that some parts of it must be doubtful if he got this one big thing wrong. And if that's wrong, what else in the story is wrong? To bring this back to the Ebionite theme, let me remind you that the main identifier of an Ebionite is the outright right rejection of Paul. Uh, for one thing, the Ebionites were poor. Ebionite means the poor. And if you follow the words of the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to end up poor. They lived communally as Jesus did, as his disciples did, and they more or less ran a soup kitchen, as far as we can tell. Um, so they were poor. They only accepted the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, which did not have any of the miracles of birth in it. Um, they denied the divinity of Jesus and any pre-existence of Jesus, which was something that Paul taught. They did believe that Jesus was a prophet, but that he was born of normal parents. Uh, and another way of saying all that is they did not believe in magic. There is no such thing as magic is an Ebionite thought. But, Jesus was wise enough to predict that people after his going would claim to have seen him here and there in inner rooms and in the wilderness. And he warned, do not believe them. Do not look for spirits of him to return elsewhere. In the next video, I'll explain more about the Ebionites and their symbols and why Bosch chose this as the central symbol for the temptation of Saint Anthony. Anyway, I'm tired. Thanks for watching Understanding the Symbols of Hieronymus Bosch, and I'll leave you with one last symbol that you should be able to figure out for yourself by now. Hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.